Hi, my name is Travis, and this is Ellie. It's good to see you. We've been missing you, haven't we, Ellie? Yes. We want you to know that you're always welcome here at Northside. If you need any information about Northside Baptist Church, just click the link below. Can you tell these nice people bye, Ellie? Bye. We hope you have a wonderful day and that Ellie and I get to see you again soon. Enjoy the message.
Our God is faithful. Amen. All right. Well, good morning. There we go. Hey, listen, I get the privilege this morning of introducing you to Miss Zoe Basham. Uh, Zoe has grown up basically our whole life here at Northside. And in fact, during this service, you'll often, to see her in the service, have to look backwards because she serves in the media team as well and tries to keep up with me on the camera, <laughs> don't you? Uh, Zoe made a decision uh, years ago, but it was weeks ago at our student camp that her and so many others, uh, but Zoe in particular, came to that realization that for the first time she really understood the weight of her sin, and it was at that moment then knows without a shadow of doubt that she had trusted Jesus and Him alone as her Savior. Is that right? And Zoe, what is your profession this morning? That's right. It's upon that profession that I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death and raised in the likeness of His resurrection. There you are. Good morning, church family. It's great to be here with you all. These are exciting times to be a part of a church family, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this church family as God has allowed us to prepare for this coming semester, our family ministry team and so many of our volunteers, uh, some of whom are in this room to, to this morning, had a sweet time of fellowship and preparation this past Wednesday night as, as it is that time of year. The summer, that finish line of summer has come quickly. As we sit here today, July 30th, uh, many of you may be aware that we are just eight days away until the official kickoff of the school year for many of our city and county school students and teachers. I know there's some here today who've already begun their school year, and in so doing, you hear parents rejoicing and children bemoaning. Actually, we had a friend of ours, uh, she takes, uh, the mom takes an, her picture every year uh, in her bathrobe, a coffee mug that says it's the most wonderful time of year. Their back-to-school picture as a family is her taking a selfie in her bathrobe and a coffee mug while their kids have the backpacks on with sullen looks on their faces. Maybe that's you this week. Uh, you have that. It's that time of year. Others of us, maybe you know, school time's long gone. Uh, kids have long graduated, but uh, you too may have your own deadlines or versions of goals looming. Uh, as we approach the latter half of this calendar year, which, by the way, only has 154 days left in 2023. If you've got those New Year's resolutions that you've got to resurrect or deadlines to revisit, goals to meet, uh, that may be worthwhile information for you. But it got me thinking of a fair question for such a time as this is, have you ever started a project or maybe set a goal uh, maybe a race that you've been to, maybe a job, and shortly after doing so, you begin to question how you'll ever really succeed or finish at all. Perhaps things were smooth at the start, but then setbacks or struggles hit. Doubt and discouragement comes knocking at your door, perhaps even defeat. I was thinking of a good friend of mine who recently uh, not too long ago, this, earlier this year, had trained for and competed in his first ever half Ironman triathlon. For some of you who are, might be unfamiliar with what that includes at that level, uh, that is simply a 1.2 mile swim, a 56 mile bike, and a 13.1 mile run. He never competed before, tried, trained and tried and did so successfully, finishing in less than seven hours. But what was funny is it took him less than seven days to determine for himself that he would not consider himself a true Iron Man until he completes a full Iron Man. And so, and so thinking, targeted 
Next year's Ironman triathlon taking place in Chattanooga, the year 2024. The only problem was in his zeal for pursuing this goal, he did not realize until after submitting payment and completing his registration that he actually signed up for this year's event only 13 weeks away instead of 13 months away like he had originally envisioned. When I saw him shortly thereafter, admittedly, he was battling some real self-doubt and fear, but he was still handling it better than I would have, my goodness. Today, my friends, we read the words of a man who had reasons to boast in his past or to bemoan his immediate circumstances but instead chose to rejoice in what lied ahead of him, determined to persevere, to run his race well. I invite you to turn with me in the book of Philippians. You may have used your context clues to know that's where we'll be. It's also in the app if you'd like to follow along there. This morning we have our text for you. In his letter, This letter to the church at Philippi, the Apostle Paul exhorted his fellow believers to continue running their race with perseverance. But he doesn't just tell them what to do. He tells them how to do it. And as a result, I believe there's a fitting message, a timely word for us, that of encouragement and hope and life for those of us who seek to run our race well this year ourselves. Look at verse 10 with me. We'll begin Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, where Paul says this, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Somebody say one thing. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue, your translation may say, I press on as my goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that as we read your word and as we pause, lift high the name of Jesus, we've sung songs, Lord, we've read your scripture that speaks of the power available to us today. I pray by only as only you can do by your spirit, that you would not allow a single soul in this space, in this place today, allow to experience your word and your worship without experiencing the power available to each and every person through Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that I pray. With one voice we say, amen. Just two questions I have for us as we observe these words from the Apostle Paul to his fellow brothers and sisters, questions that I believe are fitting and helpful to us in our lifelong journey on this thing called life, and certainly those for those who follow Christ. The first question is this, in what or whom do I trust to lead me to the finish line? You know, in this fit This metaphor of running a race, I know there's many of you who have taken part in that, and uh, not so much me because I'm not really built for distance, if you haven't noticed that, but I know there's a lot of people who research gear and footwear and things that you use, resources, maybe people, counsel, the coaches that you lean on. In our life, though, what, what is it or who is it that you trust most to lead you to the finish line? If that is the goal, to finish well, what are you putting your trust in? Who, in whom are you putting your trust that you would finish well? 
For some of you who may have studied Paul's story, you would know that Paul had a past that he could point to if he wanted to boast in his past, in his street cred. He could list them out, which he did for us. And a little bit earlier in Philippians 3, we see that Paul lists out what he had reason to boast in if in this life we could boast in our earthly accomplishments and our own strength. He said in verse 4, If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Now, I know some people read this and they got kind of beef with Paul because he kind of sounds like that kid in school that just had everything and that scored all the time, at the highest score, had all the good shoes, the back-to-school gear, his backpack was fresh, all those things. I get that. It like, sounds like a kid you want to punch in the face if you're just an average Joe in the classroom. It kind of reads like that, but see, Paul was not puffing himself up because that was his source of, of identity, his, his hope. His trust was not in his heritage. He was born in Tarsus. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, as he said. If he wanted to take claim or confidence in his identity, he studied under Gamaliel and became a Pharisee. He knew the law, studied the law. And as far as maintaining the law, his track record was flawless. He said he was persecuted the church before he encountered Jesus. He maintained the law. But as we continue in chapter 3, we get to a point where he says, what I've learned is all of that, he says, is waste. You might rightly see the translation dung, garbage, waste compared to knowing Jesus. For Paul, he didn't take pride or confidence in who he was, where he came from, what his last name was, what he had accomplished. He didn't pull up a stat sheet for the purpose of pointing to that as his source of confidence. He said, all of that, I came to know that that is waste, literal waste, compared to knowing Jesus personally. You may rightly assume and understand that it's not just a knowing about Jesus. Yes, I heard the story. Or I know about Jesus, and I can rattle off facts historically significant about Jesus. But Paul said, all of that changed when I came to know Jesus myself. When I came face to face with Jesus myself, it changed my present And my future, that power of the resurrection, is not only available to us in this life now as we sit, that we have gone from death to new life, but it's also a resurrection in the end times, in in glory with, with God forever in heaven. That's the eternity, that eternal power that Paul came to experience. My friend asked you this question. Have you accessed, have you experienced that type of resurrection power in your life? Or are you simply placing your confidence and your trust in what you know about Jesus instead of knowing him personally the way that he knows you? For those of you who do know Jesus, I'll just ask a question. Do you remember what it was like when you first came to know Jesus? Maybe you were a child at like VBS or, or youth camp or so, Family commitment as you grew up in the church. Perhaps it was a later in life commitment and understanding of the gospel. Whatever, whenever that time was, go back with me for a moment and consider what it was like when you first came to know Jesus, as Paul describes here. When you first understood the gift of God's Son. When you were first filled with the Holy Spirit and realized the Word of God went from a book on the shelf that you didn't understand to a personal letter that read as if God sent it just to you. I thought about that for me. You know, early in my life, my walk, my call to ministry, this very passage, this book became huge for me. 
This is my life verse. This is my favorite passage in all of Scripture because, you see, as a 14-year-old whose family was shattered by divorce, I was paralyzed with fear and had zero sense of belonging anywhere I went until a friend invited me to church. I was so nervous I wouldn't even bring my Bible to church because I didn't know where to look or what to open and where to find the things that my friends were speaking about. But soon I would pick up the book and I would begin to read. And later I would read Paul's accolades in chapter 3. I was discouraged because I realized, man, I can't hold a candle to this guy. This guy, he's it. He's like the captain of the squad. But you see, chapter 3 doesn't end in verse 7, does it? He says, all that is waste. That's garbage. Because I read on where Paul said his greatest desire was simply to know Jesus and to experience his power that raises the dead, that fills the empty, that equips the called and leads the aimless all the way to the finish line. I said, oh my goodness, if a man like Paul says that, what hope is there for someone like me? I realized very shortly that Simply knowing Jesus was enough to start my race and that he alone would see me through the finish line. You see, some of you need to hear this this morning, that you're trying to bring all your stuff, all the gear, all the flashy things, all your experience, all your knowledge to get in the race. And Jesus simply said, all you need is me to know me, to experience my power. That is enough. And if you rest in that kind of power, my friend, I will see you all the way through to the finish line. So in what or in whom do you place your trust right now? Because the second question is what awaits me when I do get there? What awaits me when I get to the finish line? Paul said it this way, not that I've already reached the goal or I'm already made perfect, But I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward, straining towards what is ahead, I pursue, I press on towards the goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Paul could press on in his race because he knew what, more specifically, who awaited him at the finish line. He said, I forget what is behind, the good, the bad. I press on towards what is ahead because what is before me is the prize. My goodness, that is the motivation. That is the source of inspiration. Paul, in prison, as he writes these words, determined to finish his race well because of who he knows awaits him in eternity. Lest we believe, or you that you think incorrectly that Paul's just got a cush lay up here. He's writing these words on the shore of a beach, just contemplating heaven and thinking about, man, it's, I'm just going to press on. My man is in jail experiencing persecution for what he said and done for the name and fame of Jesus. And yet he said, I forget what is behind. I press on towards what is ahead. Pastor David said it last week, and you may not have caught it. He said, if you want to be used by God in this life, you cannot look back. Your past does not define you. Your best does not sustain you in Christ through Christ, for Christ, is the only way forward in Christ. I believe we sang that this morning. I wonder, did you mean it? I'm afraid there's far too many of us feel like we've done our part, run our race, finished our course, and we've not even gone one lap yet. How many of us post-COVID Fear for safety, longing for comfort, tired, 
from all the battles we face, the arguments you've endured, the needs surrounding you, we just say, you know what, I'm just going to hit cruise control for a minute. I'm just going to step back. It's hard. It's too hard. Lest you believe I'm minimizing your pain or need, just know that everybody's felt it. We've all experienced it. The question is, for the, if those who are in Christ, will we sit down, will we give up, or will we get up and press on? Because I've looked around the world. I've seen those who are outside and apart from Christ. My friend, my hope ain't in them. My hope is not in a government that's going to figure it out and fix it all for us. My hope, my faith is in the one who defeated death, rose victorious, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. I press on, not because I've got it in me, because God's got it himself. So I don't minimize your fatigue. I do not mock your fear. I question your faith. If you cannot run in Christ, press on in your race. Man, look around. There's needs all around us. People have come to this city. Neighborhoods are being built around this very place that God has placed us. I heard one pastor, local pastor, another church here this month say these words to his people. He said, if you have been walking with Jesus for more than three years, and you are not serving or giving in some way, my friend, you got a real problem. Far too many of us are comfortable, consumed with our own needs. And I'm not saying they're not real. Don't hear that. But as I asked before, in what or in whom are you placing your trust? Because if you trust in Christ above all else, and put your faith, your hope, and identity in him, then you know that it's only by God's spirit and his power that we can continue. Why else would Jesus say to his disciples before he left this earth, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, the one who remains in me and I in you produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Please hear me carefully. For those of you who might be tempted to think like I did as a young person, that when I speak about pressing on, it's just about, you know, cowboying up or just throttling down and pushing through and just doing it because you have to and that's what you ought to do. That's not it. It's, it's only, as Jesus said here, it's only by his spirit. It's not by my strength, but it's by God's power that this is possible. Why else do we surrender our life and, and admit our need for him? At the cross, when we first came to faith in Christ, when we said, God, I can't do it, I give my life to you. Whatever I have, I bring it to you. This isn't, pressing on isn't squeezing ourselves dry. It's seeking to be faithful so that as I give of myself, I trust and know that God's going to pour into me so that I can keep going. Yes, it's hard. Again, remember where Paul is when he writes these words. He's not minimizing the struggle. He's emphasizing the source of power to see us through. It's not the earthly things. It's not the trophies. It's not the accomplishments that we can amass on this side of heaven. It's only the prize that is Jesus Christ. Jesus and only Jesus that is the source of my hope in my inspiration. How about you? Is that true of you? Is that reflected in how you live and breathe and walk and function each and every day? Those who know you closely, would they observe an uncommon trust in God more than anything else in this world? Good things are fine in this world. It's not bad to have those things, but good things become bad things when we try to replace God with those things, with those people. 
Give what you have to God. Keep going and don't give up so that you can give God the glory with whatever he allows you to do in this life. That's why Paul cites Jesus' example in Philippians 2, that great Christological hymn. He said, consider the example of Jesus that who was in very nature. God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, held on to, but instead he poured himself out, became a servant, took upon the form of sinful man, poured himself out, became obedient even to death, death on a cross, so that as God raised him, God glorifies him and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father. That's how we give God glory, is when we become obedient. Elsewhere, Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 9, a passage you might recall. He said, don't you know that the runners in a, sta- in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. Everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. What type of race are you running? In whose strength or in what resources are you placing most of your trust? If it's anything or anyone other than Jesus, my friend, you ain't going to be running long. It's only by God's grace and his power that this is possible. This passage reminded me of one of my favorite stories going all the way back to 1983 when Australia held its first ultra marathon ever. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with ultra marathons, basically you run until you die. It's real fun. Uh, And somehow... This ultramarathon race has gained in popularity. Certainly not for me and my people, but some people, they get down like that. Mr. Cliff Young was one of those men who signed up for that inaugural race to go from Melbourne to, or to Sydney, Australia. This race was such a length that they measured your time not in hours and minutes, but in days. And Mr. Cliff Young, there was a handful of men that signed up for this race. Cliff Young turned heads because he was 61 years old when he showed up. A potato farmer, as a boy, he was a young shepherd boy who helped his parents on the farm. And he signed up for the race. He not only turned heads because of his age and the demeanor with which he approached the starting line, but with what he was wearing as he approached the starting line, he showed up in work boots and overalls, a true potato farmer, before he changed clothes into his racing gear. They said, how can you do this? Are you sure you're going to make it? Aren't you concerned? He said, well, you see, growing up, I helped my family care for our 2,000 head of sheep on our 2,000-acre farm, and There was no other help around, so when we lost a sheep, I would run to to return the sheep that were lost, and sometimes it would take upwards of two or three days, and I'd be running for hours on end until I found the sheep and would bring it home. And so they said, okay, this we'll give them a shot. And then Cliff Young began to turn heads again because after day one, somehow Cliff was ahead of the respected and well-trained athletes that he was racing against. Because you see, when those athletes would stop to camp for the night to sleep six or seven hours, Mr. Cliff would sleep two or three and would just get up and continue on in his slow jog, trot, continuing in the race. A true tortoise in the hare type scenario played out. 
In less than six days, this man on that screen ran 544 miles and won the inaugural ultramarathon. He broke the previous record by two days. And his nearest competitor was still 28 miles behind him. At the end of the race, they presented Cliff with $10,000 in prize money that he had no idea was part of the deal. So instead of keeping it for himself, he thought it only right that he give away the rest of the money to, send, to share with the rest of his competitors. But you see, it's not the end story that sticks out for me when I think about Cliff Young. There's two parts of his story that, that I just love. First off, it's the work boots and overalls. He didn't come with anything fancy or flashy. He came with what he had. His experience and what he knew. And the other part of that is that Cliff kept going because no one told him he had to stop. No one told him. So he would stop briefly to rest for a couple hours and just keep going. Very slow, but very consistent pace. I share Cliff's story because as I look at, over the course of my life, there's been times when I'm, when I'm tired, when I've experienced defeat, crippling discouragement, fear, doubt, myself, what I'm doing, why I'm here, why would God ask me to do what he's asked me to do, my effectiveness, my worth, all those things. But you see, the problem with those types of questions, it keeps me at the center. But when I return to Christ and when I seek to be filled with his spirit, led by his word, called by his purpose and for his glory, I'm able to continue on. It doesn't mean that I'm sprinting all the time. It doesn't mean that it's easy, that I enjoy it all the time but it means I keep going. And by God's grace, if it were up to me, I would not be here. I don't have it. Some of you know that. Like, I don't have it. We don't have it. It's only by God's grace that we're able to be here. My fear is some of us just aren't wanting to rely upon God anymore. Some of us are comfortable to, to cruise our way out instead of giving what we have, putting it in God's hand and say, God, I trust that you'll be faithful. You've never failed me yet. I'm going to press on towards the goal to win the prize. Perhaps your vision has gone more horizontal instead of vertical. So this morning, as we close, would you perhaps simply by faith and obedience, look once again, to the author and sustainer of your faith, that you would trust in him, that you would continue to run your race with perseverance because you know we are, our citizenship, as he says later in chapter three, is in heaven. This is not our home. So we will continue to run, to crawl, to strain, to press on in whatever means necessary until we reach the end the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Some of you, we need you. There's a generation coming up who needs to hear from the generations before. Would you be faithful? Would you give? Would you serve in a class? Would you speak to a child? Would you encourage your neighbors? Would you love those in the community who are hard to love instead of just resting in your comfort?